Hi, thanks for joining. My name is Rhys Lewis and I'm a postdoc at TU Delft in the Alchemy Lab. Today we'd like to talk to you about how we can use signal-induced and fuel-driven approaches to induce micelle formation and deformation in complex coisivate core micelles. So I'd just like to firstly introduce what uh, coisivate core micelles are. So these are self-assembled nanoparticles um, which can form in water when you mix polycations and polyanions where one of these polymers has a water-soluble block attached to it. Um, they consist of a polyelectrolyte core and a shell of neutral water-soluble blocks. And the reason why these can form is because uh, polyelectrolytes can phase separate in aqueous solutions, which uh, is really driven by this fairly entropically favorable process, where upon these polyelectrolytes condensing into the glycivate phase, their bound counterions can then release into the bulk solution. Uh, now, much like amphiphilic micelles, uh, coisivate core micelles can attain a range of morphologies from spheres to worms to uh, vesicles. And this can be done by playing with the block length ratio, so the size of your polycation, polyanion, water soluble block, um, as well as things like the pH or the salt concentration. And just as an example, in our own lab, we've seen transitions from uh, worm like uh, species to spheres simply by increasing the polyanion charge density. Now, really what I want to focus on today is looking at ways to transition from micelle structures to just individual polymers in solution um, by uh, some sort of signal. So traditionally, this can be done by playing with the pH or salt concentration in solution. So obviously with the pH, you're going to change the degree of ionization of your polymer. And polymers with a lower degree of ionization are less likely to form micelles, so that can trigger their deformation. Similarly with salt concentration, at high salt concentration, that release of bound counterions to the bulk solution um, becomes less favorable, and that can also then trigger micelle deformation. But what we really want to develop and look at is some kind of chemical trigger that can operate uh, at both constant pH and salt concentration. Um, we think that this you know, could have some kind of application potentially in uh, transient ionic catalysis uh, uh, and things like that, but also um, it could be really interesting for, for uh, gene therapy applications where people look to encapsulate nucleic acids, so these really large polyanions, uh, and then have them later be released inside a cell. So the way in which we're going to achieve this is through a, a chemical cycle which was developed by a PhD in Ashton Benjamin Clem. And essentially, the way this, this works is uh, we have this um, uh, fuel or activator species, which is a Michael acceptor or, or electrophilic type species, and it can react with a range of nucleophiles, including tertiary amines. Now, the interesting thing about its reaction with tertiary amines is it forms this um, cationic uh, quaternary species here. And this species can then actually further react uh, with another nucleophile in the solution, um, regenerating back your starting polyamine and creating this waste product down here. Of course, now once you're back with your starting uh, polyamine, you can then repeat this cycle again as many times as you like, um, allowing you to continuously transition between a neutral uh, amine and uh, cationic amine uh, states. The other cool thing about the cycle is it's, it's quite tunable. So the forward reaction can be uh, have its rate tuned by the, the, the reactivity of this species. Um, and today we're going to look at two examples, but of course, in principle, you could really tune this uh, quite a lot more if you like. Uh, these are going to be abbreviated by DVP and ME, uh, with DVP being the less reactive of those two species. Similarly, the back reaction can be tuned by the nucleophilicity of that second nucleophile in the, species, in the solution. Um, and for, for relatively fast back reaction, you want a strong nucleophile such as a thiol, so in this case, you know, drawing the cap to ethanol. Um, and for a bit of a slower back reaction, you can use a weakly nucleophile such as a primary amine. Now, for this, uh, obviously, to work with coisivate core micelles, these amines need to be incorporated into polymers. And they then need to be mixed with uh, a polyanion as well. Um, and so then you would ideally start with uh, some polymers in solution uh, with your neutral polyamine. However, after that first reaction with our fuel activator species generating your cationic polyamine, we should then be able to generate coisivate core micelles. So specifically for the polyamine in, in this project, uh, we're going to use a polymer of this structure here. Uh, so this was synthesized by rough polymerization and it contains two blocks. Uh, the first block is a polymer of dimethylacrylamide, around 260 units, and that's going to form our uh, neutral uh, shell blocks. Uh, the second block uh, is a copolymer of uh, vinyl pyridine and dimethylacrylamide, and that's going to form our core, so that contains our functional um, tertiary amine units. Uh, 
Now, the reason why we didn't just simply go for a homopolymer of vinyl pyridine uh, is because uh, pH 7.4 vinyl pyridine is neutral, uh, as is, of course, required for this cycle to work. We want to transition from a neutral to a charged species. However, that also means that this vinyl pyridine unit is relatively hydrophobic. Uh, and we know from experiments that we've done that if we just simply have a homopolymer on this block, then we will generate amphiphilic micelles in water. Uh, and of course, that then means we've got to start with amphiphilic micelles over here and then try and transition into coespheric core micelles, which uh, is not really what we're trying to achieve today. So that's why we have this polymer structure here. For the polyanion, uh, we're going to use a high molecular weight commercial polystyrene sulfonate. Uh, so it was around 200 kilodons. And of course, in principle, we could really almost use any polyanion with the system, but we went with this because uh, we knew it formed relatively monodispersed spherical micelles with our charged polyamine. Now, for the first set of experiments I want to present to you today, um, we're going to just look at sequential additions of one equivalent of the fuel and then one equivalent of our deactivated nucleophile. This should then allow for equilibrium formation of coespheric core micelles, followed by regeneration back of our starting polymer solution. In each case, that nucleophile will be our strong uh, recapped weapon. So, within these results, I want to start with looking at this ME, this slightly faster activating uh, um, species. So if we have our polymers in solution, our polyamine and our uh, 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 polyanion, and then we add one equivalent of this, this uh, activating species, we could follow it by a range of techniques, and one of those is NMR. So NMR can allow us to see the consumption of this, this activating species, as well as the production of the cationic groups on our polymer chain. And if we do that, we note that we achieve around 80% conversion, uh, which sort of plateaus after a while, and, and this occurs over the, the first two to four hours. Uh, later on, can that add one equivalent of our thiol to then regenerate back our starting neutral polymer? And, and that's exactly what we observed by NMR. You could also follow this by physical measurements such as dynamic light scattering. Um, and so in this case, what we're going to try to look at is the Brownian motion of the, the particles in our, our solution, or, po or the polymers in our solution, um, and then relate that to their size. Uh, and one other thing that's going to be occurring here is um, as these micelles form, uh, we're going to expect the amount of light scattered to increase really rather significantly as larger uh, objects are known to scatter more light than smaller objects. And so if we just look at the amount of light scattered over time with this uh, matching conditions from our NMR experiment, we can see they correlate pretty nicely. We have a rather rapid increase in the amount of light scattered, about threefold increase uh, after addition of our ME fuel. Um, and then later on, when we add our thiol to regenerate back our neutral polyamine and uh, break apart the micelles, you can see that light scattered really rather rapidly drops down. We can then repeat this experiment, um, but this time trying to get two cycles out of it, so uh, running the forward and back uh, two times each. So here I presented the data for, again, the amount of light scattered, but also the number average size of our species as determined by DLS. You can see both of those increase nicely after addition of our ME species to form the micelles, and then that rather rapidly drops away after addition of our thiol to break them back apart. In the second cycle, you can see you get exactly the same behavior happening again, and rather nicely, you can also see that those peak values in the number average and light scattered are really pretty closely correlated, um, as well as the minimums. You could then uh, also follow this uh, exact same experiment uh, by taking samples for TEM to see if after each fuel addition, we had uh, micelles present, and as you can see by these TM images below, uh, we're pretty convinced that we indeed did. And uh, you can also check to see after each thiol addition if those micelles were then removed from the system. And once again, looking down here, you can see uh, we're fairly sure that they have now been removed. So we also ran this experiment with uh, DVP as our activating species, and we got really similar results. However, today I'm just going to move on and uh, try and talk about some other results in the interest of time. So what about if we have excess of fuel? So for example, if we start with three equivalents of our fuel species here, uh, and we mix them with our, our polymers, well, we, of course, we initially expect to form uh, micelles through, through charging of our amine. However, at this stage, we should still have some fuel remaining in the system. And uh, if we now mix in one equivalent of this, this thiol to, to re uh, break apart our micelles, if it preferentially reacts with this charged species over the, the remaining fuel in the system, then we should regenerate back our, our neutral uh, polyamine and basically our polymers again. Um, but the excess fuel in the system will then allow for the cycle to then spontaneously reform the micelles over time, eventually leading to, to return to this micelle state. And experimentally, that's actually exactly uh, what we observed. So if we start with three equivalents of either the DVP or the methyl ester, um, you can see that 
uh, our number average increases uh, over time, uh, indicating the formation of micelles as exactly you would expect. And obviously that's then probably led to consumption of one equivalent of your fuel. Um, for DBP, this happens at around 100 hours. Methyl ester, it's a lot more rapid, around an hour. At this stage, you can then add one equivalent of your thiol to break apart the micelles, return to your polymer solution. Um, and then you can see spontaneously the number average starts to increase again uh, over a really long time for DVP or rather rapid in the case of ME, uh, indicating you get this transient micelle deformation and, and eventually the system returns to its more equilibrium micelle state. You can do this in theory one more time. However, in the case of DVP, we didn't really observe a return to micelles after addition of a, a second equivalent of thiol. But in the case of ME, we did. It uh, once again regenerated these, these micelles and that final equivalent of thiol then ultimately led to uh, a permanent polymer solution. Now, the last example I want to show you today uh, is what happens if we have a much uh, weaker nuclear file. So the back reaction is quite a bit slower. Can we then get transient micelle formation out of equilibrium micelle formation? Um, and indeed, I think we can. Um, so if we start with two equivalents of either the DVP or the ME fuel, um, we can then have that combined with either five to eight equivalents of our three and in our weaker nucleophile. So eight in the case of DVP and five for the uh, methyl ester. Now, what's basically happening here is we get an initial um, buildup of our cationic species leading to, to uh, micelle formation. Um, and then uh, eventually all of the fuel is then depleted in our system. Uh, and then this excess of our treonine, our, our weakened nucleophile, eventually starts to react with all of that, um, uh, breaks apart all of those cationic species, and eventually we then get regeneration of our uh, neutral polymers in solution. And you can see that behaving pretty nicely with these graphs. So you get an increase in the scatter count over time, uh, which then reaches a plateau and then starts to drop off back to near starting levels. Similarly with the number average, uh, you can see that increases as soon as we add our fuel to start this system, and then it starts to drop back uh, over time. So in conclusion, uh, I hope I've been able to demonstrate how we can control coagulation and coagulate core micelles using a Michael acceptor type cycle. We can tune the rate of formation and deformation depending on our choice of fuel or nucleophile. Um, combined, this gives uh, equilibrium single induced as well as non equilibrium type behavior. Uh, I would like to thank uh, my ASM lab uh, colleagues. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure working with them, uh, in particular, uh, Rink, uh, Benjamin, and Mariana, who assist on this project, uh, ERC for the funding, and you for listening. Uh, I'll now have to take any questions.